touch of your hand Behind a closed door All I needed was the love you gave All I needed for another day And all I ever knew Only you Okay, welcome to the Stage Left podcast, lifting the veil on the music industry by telling the stories of those with a unique vantage point. The podcast exists to provide free educational content for young musicians entering an increasingly complex industry by telling the stories of some of the unsung heroes behind the success. Go to thestageleftpodcast.com for all episodes featuring musicians who discuss in detail the recording, writing and performing processes uh, of the likes of working with uh, Elvis Presley, Michael Jackson, The Beatles, Fleetwood Mac, Nick Cave, Oasis, uh, Alanis Morissette, The Damned, The 1975 and Bob Dylan. Uh, You'll also find Tony Visconti on producing David Bowie's final album, Black Star, BAFTA award-winning comedian Stuart Lee on his creative processes uh, and how they derive from watching freestyle jazz artists, uh, Wolfgang Fleur of Kraftwerk on the moment he created the world's first ever electronic drum machine, and Steve Cropper on writing Dock the Bay with Otis Redding. And today we're joined by Richard Oakes of Suede, who uh, joined Suede aged only 17 and went on to co-write hits such as uh, Beautiful Ones, uh, and Sean McGee, who uh, in the studio has mixed number one to the likes of Britney Spears and is a live programmer, backing vocalist and co-writer with Alice. And Moye. Today they are Art Magic, uh, the experimental uh, melodic project that merges different influences and styles. Uh, and Sean and Richard uh, have just uh, released their second album uh, it's entitled The Songs of Other England. So it's a pleasure to say that our guests today on the Stage Air podcast are Richard Oakes and Sean McGee. Um, thanks for joining us today both. How's it going? Very good, yeah. Thanks for having us. Great stuff. And so The Songs of Other England, I've been enjoying the uh, album the last couple of days. Um, really interested in one particular song to start with to discuss. My favourite song on the album called The Dark of the Human human heart. Uh, what is the dark of the human heart? Do I say this one? Yes, you can say it. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not going to name names, but there was a certain figure in public discourse um, who was saying such continually offensive and outrageous things um, and using it as a selling point and was beginning to develop a kind of almost an army of people supporting these kind of terrible ideas that they were having. And I started to think about the fact that we are kind of nurtured to believe that the human heart is sort of the font of love and compassion and affection. And I started thinking, well, actually, none of that really means anything unless you have like an intellect to keep it all in check. And perhaps the human heart doesn't necessarily come down on the side of love and compassion, that it is, in fact, selfish and hateful and wants to see people fail and is like happy to watch other people suffering. And maybe it's the intellect that is the game weight on that. And that's where that song started from, because I was thinking that, you know, maybe we've just heard all this stuff about how beautiful we are inside, and it's actually not true, and that human nature is more likely to bring us to a darker place than a lighter place. Um, so, yeah, really jolly stuff. What was interesting is that with, with that song is that I like, if I was to hear that song instrumentally, I think I would have guessed what the song was about lyrically. <laughs> so it's quite nice how that married up. What do you remember about actually creating that song between you? It was one of the few on the album where... It didn't start from absolutely nothing in the room together. I had the chorus idea, which I'd literally started working on half an hour before Richard turned up, and I'd had the title in my head for a while. And I had this, core, this kind of vague chord progression and a melody. And then Richard came over and helped me perfect that chord progression and then wrote the music for the verse in about five minutes. <laughs> it came together incredibly quickly. Yeah, well, the mood was very much established, and it's always, you know, it's always a little bit quicker and easier once you've, you've got that established mood um, to kind of uh, yeah flesh it out and turn it into a, a progressive piece which is what we did mm. and right from the start it was quite sort of heavy going and we knew we wanted this kind of funereal drum beat yeah it was, it was kind of written over that it was there from the start yeah. the drums are amazing on it. Is it are they programmed or is there someone playing that no that's part? real that's yeah. um yeah. That's Alex, Alex Thomas, who is currently Anna Calvi's drummer. He's out with her on tour shortly. He's played with John Cale, he's played with Square Pusher, he's played with Bandy Drum Boy. Um, extraordinary musician. Really good for us, actually, because we were working very quickly on this record. We were trying to just kind of make quick choices and stick with them. And Alex took a very instinctive approach to the material, and he's the kind of fluid musician who can make those fast choices and make them work. And he did all the drums for the record across 15 or 16 song ideas we had in four days. From a technical perspective, um, recording those drum parts, the toms just sound so good. Can you remember where the mic positions were or like that? Or <laughs> well, the toms sound amazing. Alex does what a lot of drummers do now, where as well as like 
doing live work and so on, in order to do session work, they have themselves set up so they can work on remote. So mm. they will have, he has a basement in his home and actually Tottenham Uni lives 10 minutes away from me. And he has a, a beautifully set up basement with all the right preamps, you know, some really nice microphones, a really nice desk. And he's kind of set up with everything in such a way that you can give him your parts, he can drum on them and give you extremely high standard recordings on the way back. Now, I don't specifically remember um, where the mics were, but it's all set up in, in, in the sense of being like quite generalised. Mm. So he gets it in a position where the kit is tuned really well and it's set up so it's a good, kind of quite close sort of 70s style sound um, and is set up to be that as a default for everything. And then the only thing we really swapped was the snares themselves. Yeah, yeah. but even that was quick. I mean, I've done sessions where if you decide to swap a snare, it would take kind of like two hours to get a decent sound on it and you'd be waiting and waiting, but he did it in two seconds. Well, we were kind of taking a bit of a risk because we knew we were just going to spend do this thing quickly and we're kind of working on faith a little bit that the recording quality would be sufficiently high. Um, I mean, I'd been down to see his space and heard stuff he'd recorded before, so I knew that it would be, but it's that thing about, you know, you're changing snares, you're changing mic positions, are you sure it's going to be okay? Yeah. And I had a bit, got everything back to my studio after the first day and listened and knew within like two seconds that it was all going to be fine. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you're not making the kind of record where you really have the time or really the ability to spend a week like repositioning microphones around the snare to get the snare sound. Mm. Um, and frankly, if the recordings had come back and there was something about the snare sound we didn't like, we could have always just replaced it mm. in seconds now because, of course, we have the technology to do that. But we didn't have to do that. No, no. Yeah. And one thing I really like uh, about listening to your stuff is that your chord progressions constantly keep us guessing. <laughs> I can never feel like I can guess what the next chord is listening to your mm. stuff. Um, is that... a, a, a there's not a huge amount of repetition. It's kind of constant. You're challenging the listener. Is that a technique that you've actively uh, you've, you actively pursue, or is that something you've developed? Or it's um, something that I've always tried to pursue. I've always had a real interest in progressive music. I'm not a big fan of things that, despite being a massive fall fan, this is the irony. I'm not really a big fan of music that just does one thing and then repeats and repeats. Um, so yeah, I've always tried to, and I've written some really simple music with Sway, stuff like Film Star off coming up, it's like a really, uh, deliberately simple, um, but really my heart lies in, um, as you say, keeping the listener guessing and, and um, chord sequences that take left turns and do something, or follow a melodic theme but do something that you're not expecting, and there's, I think there's that kind of stuff all over, like Black Flowers Bloom, for example, doesn't have a second verse, it has verse one, chorus, bridge, chorus, and then... Um, goes into another bit, doesn't it? Mm. And then, then back into the second bridge. And so that was quite deliberate. We thought, let's try and, yeah, sort of perhaps challenge the listener a bit more. That always sounds a bit pretentious when you say challenge the listener, but it, there was a, an element of that. You need people to be able to get their teeth into something, you know. And when you're writing those chord progressions, perhaps for someone else to write the melody over, because I know you've done that in mm. Suede in the past, yeah. I guess, is there a melody that you're writing in your own head that eventually isn't used because it's changed? Well, no, sometimes. I mean, if you look at Beautiful Ones, that was um, that was the, the, the sort of main vocal hook at the end, the la-la's, was actually a guitar, guitar riff, yeah, yeah. yeah, to start with. Because the verse is pretty much... then adapted into a different type of... So that was kind of... Brett just followed that, really. And we've done one example of that in Art Magic. We did a song called Up, which was a digital-only release when the last album came out. And that was um, the, the vocal melody was based around what the arpeggio on the guitar yeah, was doing. Yeah, pretty much what the guitar is doing. It's, so it suggests some, the melody instantly. Sometimes it happens, but I do like vocalists to be able to put their own, to come up with their own melody. And that come, it obviously comes from years and years of working with Brett, decades of working with Brett. And um, yeah, almost a decade of working with yeah, Brett it's, now. It's, it's just, been 10 years. You just, I like a singer to be able to put their own mark on it and to own, own the music, you know. That's always how you get the best result. But I mean, a lot of the music was quite collaborative on this record because Richard would come over and sit down with his acoustic guitar and I'd sit at the piano and we'd begin to thrash through ideas together. And you probably got sick of me saying things like, try putting the seventh in there. <laughs> um, Not at all. But that's how we would originate the music. You know, like Richard would be the main driving force because he's a much more fluid musician than I am, but I would be there kind of running interference in my slightly kind of not the world's greatest keyboard player sort of way. And I love those kind of interesting chord changes too. And actually, I love what Richard does naturally. It's something I keep saying to people. It's like, they ask questions about what we do stylistically, and it's like, I just want to let Richard be Richard and then join in. 
you know. Mm. So what the things that you like, we have similar tastes in that regard. Yes. We both like t- quite tasty chord progressions, and we both like, you know, interesting structures, and we're not afraid to just kind of go headlong into it together yeah, and yeah, find yeah. out where it takes yeah. us. How have you stretched yourself on this album? So what was the kind of biggest stretch for you guys on this album? I think it was probably the, the, the starting point. I wouldn't say we had a manifesto, but definitely one of the um, key points when we started was that we were going to write it from scratch. On the, on the first Art Magic record, I brought a lot of music to Sean that I'd already preconceived and um, demoed at home and stuff like that. And we, you know, things like Half Life, there's still a lot of that's still my home demo mm-hmm. from 2007 or whenever it was. Um, but this time we thought, no, blank page. You know, I'm not scared of the blank page. A lot of people are. Um, I like thinking, right, you could do anything. We haven't started down this road yet. And so that was a good, you know, and just day one, what are you going to write? What mood are you in? Um, that was kind of a, yeah, that was a key point to start, was that we do everything spontaneously. Yeah. Does the mood or emotion that you are currently in then uh, dictate the music that you write? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, um, sometimes we have a, an idea, like the Dark of the Human Heart is a good example. Sean said, I want to do this song about this. And that kind of establishes how the music is, is going to end up sounding in, in some ways hmm. um, but other times it's just really you know have you had a good week or a bad week you know how are you what's going on I mean we had, a lot of things happened while we were writing this album we had that year where everybody died what was that 2015 yeah. 2016 2016 yeah. and then we had the, the Brexit and Trump year and you know various weird things going on in our careers and personal lives and it's like so all those things influence how you're feeling when you turn up on Tuesday morning you know absolutely <laughs> Yeah. I mean, we'd force the issue a bit as well because quite a lot of the songs, um, I didn't want to start forcing arrangements ideas onto them at the writing stage, but I would often program up like the most kind of basic sounding drum machine as a tempo or as a beginning of. I wouldn't, I would hesitate to even call it a groove in the case of something like that, but as something to give us a very vague frame to hang the music. A grid. Around. Yeah, yeah it gives a grid. Yeah, really. Uh, and in some cases, like with the clean room. Like that was like the very first thing was like dr- funny drum thing that goes all the way through. Yeah. We came up with that to go with Richard's guitar line very quickly at the beginning of the process. So there would be little things where you'd force it, but yeah. otherwise it was just what mood are you in? We deliberately didn't do um, fleshed out kind of demos either. We didn't need to this time because we weren't taking them to a, to a band the mm. way that we did last time. Um, yeah, we we the, all, all the kind of recordings we have for a long time actually were just one acoustic guitar detuned down to. D, I think, was yeah. it? and then just a beatbox, and we just wrote wrote the songs, and you come up with the chords and the melodies on the guitar and the, the melody on the vocal, and they stay like they but they stayed like that quite deliberately up until the point where we were um, forking out for recording studio time for Alex the drummer and um, for when we did the guitars at a place in North Acton, yeah. and um, then we started thinking, okay, arrangements, parts, you know, and it wasn't that wasn't laziness, it was just that we didn't want to be kind of we didn't want to preconceive too much and then just reproduce what we'd done at Sean's house in the studio. We wanted the studio to actually create this um, body of work and the way it sounded. Mm. For someone who's not, um, if we have a listener who's, who's not detuned uh, guitars before, <laughs> what does detuning the D or different tunings allow you to do that you wouldn't be able to do creatively in standard just, tuning? To be honest, I mean, I've always, I very rarely play in standard concert pitch, which is what all of the Beatles back catalogue and every, all the songs you know will have been yeah. written in standard tuning, you know, E tuning. In Suede, it's all, it pretty much always um, E flat for some reason. I don't know, I can't, I've forgotten why it's lost in the mist of history, why that is, but we always tune down to E flat. Um, and then we just had, it was just chance really, wasn't it? We, your guitar, you've been doing stuff with Alison Moyer and it was tuned down to D. Yeah. For some reason, and it just means that you kind of, when you play like a, an open C shape or an open A shape or anything that you're very familiar with, if you listen to Bob Dylan or Buddy Holly or anything, um, it sounds different because it's in a different key, and you kind of different. It inspires different musical ideas and definitely a different type of melodic idea. Um, if the if the guitar is just tuned down a bit, still it's still in the same tuning relationship between the strings, yeah. but but in a different. Key, yeah, it's not the kind of Nick Drake or Bert Jansch type thing of where you're actually yeah. changing the actual tuning yeah. relationship between the strings. Yeah. yeah, it's just the standard guitar tuning we all know, yeah. but in our case, down a tone, just a tone lower. Got it. It Got just it. means that you can play all those familiar chords and they sound different and they suggest different things. It's very simple. Nice. Um, and uh, when you're writing for different vocalists, does that play into your mind other than the key that you know might be the range that the vocalist is particularly? 
familiar or like singing is does it play into your mind when you're writing different chord progressions and stuff like that so if you were to write a song for Brett and then write a song that Sean was going to sing what would be the differences in your approach um, I think there's only a real difference if I've been kind of um, requested or instructed to do a certain thing like often but I mean this, this has happened with, with, with Sean as well so I want to do something a bit more like this um, but, and then with Brett it happens quite a lot especially once you're into the journey of writing an album and you, you kind of know what it's going to be then he starts being specific about we need something like this I want you to write something like this and he'll have some reference template a few, a few songs that he'll play and when we have a writing session and that'll be the um, and I'll, th- I'll get into that headspace and go right and write something that's, that's got this kind of feeling um, but if I just write spontaneously it could no there's, there's, I, don't, I don't have a specific personality in mind for who's going to um, contribute to and who's going to co-write the song with me no not at all it's just it's all 100% me until um, you know you write your part over the top or Brett writes his part and then mm. it becomes a co-write it becomes a, a yeah a joint effort um, when you are have a blank pa- piece of paper in front of you um, what is the creative well you go to when, when you haven't got any immediate ideas what do you do about writer's block and that kind of thing what do you um, have a cup of tea normally. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't really have a. Um, do you mean default inspiration yeah, points? Yeah. Like, um, what do you do if, if you're like, right, okay, do you wait for the song to come to you or do you chase some form of inspiration somewhere, whether think, it be written or listening to, whatever it might be? If you're working on something that's already established, then you kind of chip away at it until. This is what I do with Neil chip away and chip away until you come up with the right part or the right middle eight or the right ending or something. But if you're starting from scratch you can't really force it no if nothing nothing comes and nothing comes i mean we didn't really have days like that when we wrote this album I mean, we wrote about 24 or 25 ideas and so obviously some of them were c-listers mm. and didn't get taken past demo stage yeah. but i think everything we did we made an effort to turn every every piece of work on that day into yeah. a song of we some always kind. got something at the end of the day this, yeah. this is actually a rule in suede as well we always try and write something even if it's you're not really feeling it still because giving up is not really it's, it's not an option you know <laughs> you have to kind of we're here to create that's our job and it's what we want to do and you sleep easier at night if you know that you've kind of you know done your best and creativity is kind of an effort of will yes because it's sort of you're it beginning is, to you do- it's not something inspiration possibly is something that falls on you but you've still got to actually put that into effect and, and turn it into a and a, a creative process but current yeah we're just trying to get a song written as often just building a structure by sheer force of will mm. you know I can so many times when it's just like Richard's just trying out some guitar ideas and I'll be like oh that's interesting and it's because you've got your un- your antennae up and you're sort of thinking creatively in another atmosphere you might not think that that idea is mm. particularly ear grabbing but because you're thinking in that direction already one small thing that he does on the guitar particular chord change, particular emphasis can start you thinking. And then it's like, well, what if we try here or go here? Oh, I think I've got a melody. What if that's an A part? Let's try and write a B part. Let's put them together. What could be the melody over these? And on you go. And then suddenly by the end of the day, you've got something. It doesn't always mean that it's gold, but you have got something. There's a lot of peripheral kind of thinking in, in being inspired by something as well. Like when you can sort of, something can catch your ear, if you're not really listening fully and concentrating fully, there's that kind of peripheral thing. It's, I don't know how to explain it. Like defocused listening. Almost. Yes, exactly. Where you sort of something just sort of you absorb something rather than concentrating on it. And this happens to me a lot when I when I listen to new records. I'll kind of defocus and start doing something else, and then realise suddenly, hey, I quite like this song. You know, and without having thought about it at all in any kind of you know um, focused way, you just sort of let it, you let yourself absorb it, and then that's how inspiration happens, that's how you discover things.
writing as a pair and releasing the songs, kind of, uh, releasing your album as two of you, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I've done that myself in the past, and I think you have to have the right dynamic of relationship when it comes to maybe decision making on what is the final thing we're going to do or not do. Is that something you discussed before that comes naturally? If you have two separate ideas, how do you decide which, you know, the democracy says it's 50-50, so how do you go about that? I think, um, yeah, no, we, we, there's, 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 <laughs> we, yeah we, we kind of very rarely find that we're having big disagreements about music. There's a, uh, art magic, the influences of art magic is a total Venn diagram. There's a lot of stuff in the bit in the middle, isn't there, yeah. <laughs> that we both like, but there's also large areas that, I mean, Sean's has been listening to a lot of English folk music recently, and that's, um, and I've been listening to a lot of sort of um, Orange County psychedelic glam punk, so there's no crossover there at all, obviously. <laughs> um, but it's, but we don't, I don't find that I'm trying to sort of pull art magic in the direction of what I'm listening to and what I like in terms of sonics, and Neither are you, really. It's kind of we. What we do is we take those as inspiration, and then we put them into the pot. Mm. And but there's cre- so and many... create something that doesn't sound like either, you know. But not necessarily from a create point of view, then. But there's so many decisions that have to be made through that process, even track listing, even song title, whatever it might be. How do you? Is it just something that you just go with and you don't really have any discipline? Well, Clara Veto is quite important. Like, we effectively both have a veto. Yeah. So if one of us really doesn't want a thing, then we don't do a thing. Fine. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. And that sort of... It seems to be a very sensible place to start from, so that you don't tend... You don't you don't start having ridiculous creative arguments about the minutiae. Yeah. If you just sort of say, I don't think this song is right for the record. And maybe you can put up a bit of a fight, but when it comes down to it, like even when we were mixing, yeah. the the choice of the 14 songs we were going to bring to a final mix mm. was just the songs almost made that decision themselves, really. And we finished the 14 songs, and then it was starting to think about album track listings, and I really got into a thing about the track listing and came up with some ideas, and we went back and forth, and there was a song... You, you kept culling tracks, as I recall. Yeah, I thought <laughs> it was going to be enough. longer. The, the red pen came out. This, and, you know, Ultimately, this isn't good enough, and you have to have a bit of distance from the writing to actually be able to think like that. But, um, yeah, I don't remember being too upset by the decisions you were making. What, what were the metrics you were using for like, the measurements on what is good? So if it's not good enough... What was it that you were? What, what didn't it have that other tracks had? Well, most of the album has a real mood about it. It's a real interesting mood piece. You know, the whole album really has a certain kind of feeling. You know, and there were the three songs that we finished but didn't put on the record are like perfectly good, but they're just they kind of lack that slight colour that the other things on the record have. Yeah, like everything that's on the album has something very specific and special and a certain kind of colour or tint about them, which these just didn't have in quite the same way. They were a little bit more normal. They were a little bit sort of verse bridge chorus, a little bit more indie pop almost. Mm -hmm. They're not bad songs by any means. No, but they didn't, they weren't as representative of the overall album as as the 11 tracks that are on there are. Mm. And that was, that representation was really important because you could feel when you were trying to put one of them into the track listing that things started rubbing up the wrong way that you yeah. were trying to combine two separate worlds that didn't really go together you know and it changes the overall feel it's not really to do with kind of lowering the quality or raising the quality it's to do with the fact that it, if it changes the overall feel you want the feel of the record to be as focused as possible and then so some of the sort of you know the, the, some of the songs make it feel less focused so they're the ones that end up being culled yeah yeah, and it's just what we came up with. I say cold, I mean, um, you know, saved for later. <laughs> B-sides. Yeah, exactly. Well, the yeah. stuff that really gets cold is the stuff that's just not good enough to make it past demo stage, oh, or yeah, that yeah, is, yeah. where the mood is so different. Yeah. You might come back to it. Like we've, I've said before, there's a couple of things that we did. 21 Forever is the best example. Yeah, and there's another one called um, I Just Want to Be Your Fan, yeah. which is kind of a cute little piece, but it wouldn't have fitted at all. And there's always the yeah. worry with a title like that that your fan base... <laughs> would immediately go, why are they singing about us? Which is not what it's about. Um, and it's nice, but it's just it was like, mm. it just didn't fit. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you just have to make those decisions and stand by them. If this is the record, this is the mood you want, that's what you have to stick with. And then, yeah, and I, I'm, I'm not really a fan of, there's plenty of artists, some of whom are very close to home, who are quite retrospectively, um, you know, oh, I wish I'd done it differently. And they kind of, um, 
I swear I've never actually done it, but I think Morrissey has changing records. Oh, endlessly. You know, I didn't. It, it was supposed to be more like this, and it's like you. And then when they reissue it, it's got a different cover, and it's got like some random B side instead of a, one of the album oh, tracks. Such and nonsense. You just think it's no point in being, you know, retrospectively changing it and being revisionist. And I don't think the document is the document, warts and all. You know, I mean, it's the closest way it ever came to it was we re-recorded the vocals on Trash for some reason when, when the greatest hits came out and it just didn't have the same really it didn't sound as good as the original the, because the original had been very spurred and Brett hated the way he sounded on it you know understandably um, but that is how it is and you can't change it once it's out there it's Absolutely. out there like our first, <laughs> our first album there's a couple of things we wrote after it was finished which we needed for B-sides or bonus track and stuff that a couple of there's a song called The Glass Arcades and a, a song called Up which are so good and I think if we if they'd been written th- even three months earlier, mm. there's no question they would have been in contention for being on the record. Mm. And the record could have ended up having a different mood because of those things. But that's not how it works out. And you can look back and say, well, I wish this had been there and we could have swapped this around, but that's just not what it is. Yeah. And I don't like that revisionist tendency that bands have. It's like, we can one day in the future do a cracking deluxe reissue of that record yeah. with all these extra tracks on this too and say how yeah. great it all was. But the album is the album is the album. Those are the yeah. choices you made at the time. And who wants to be a kind of stylist revisionist about these things? Maybe it's, it's because pointless. things do get reissued every five minutes. So yeah. People like <laughs> Demon who are to blame. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to talk about some of the individual stuff you do, but actually with, with both of yours uh, opinions on this and uh, your experience. But So the, you know the thing you do with Britney Spears? Yes. The mixing. I'm really interested in... What was your remit on that? And do you get the original stems? Because I think that's a song with a piano and a vocal. Well, I engineered and programmed it as well, so I was there from the beginning. You were there from the beginning, yeah. right? Okay. So, how? What's your remit in the? If you could, you put drums on that if you wanted to, or could you? How does it work in regards to what's your role specifically, and, and what's your boundaries for making? Because you can make a lot of changes in that. Well, specifically with that track, I was working closely with a producer called Guy Sigsworth, and for four oh, years, yeah. me and Guy were. I was his right hand man, so I would be his programmer, his engineer, his mixer. But Guy has very definite creative opinions, and so his the kind of producer mixer relationship in his world is closer to a director editor relationship would be in the film world Mm. so the editor can have some direction over the process but the director is the one who has assembled all the footage and the performances the way they want them to be the editor can have some influence on how those are presented to get the narrative across the most clearly and that's how it worked with me and guy it's like i wouldn't take the thing away from him and get to work and also it was iterative because a lot of those mixing decisions would be baked into the multi-track because of choices and sound design that would have been made along the way um, and it was quite a complicated track technically because it has this floating tempo it's for each bar it goes up and down in BPM through it goes like from beat one and then it's faster by beat three and slows back down really? again by beat one of the next bar but because it was done in a really quick off the cuff way I didn't have time to put a proper tempo map together and I'm not even sure that the old this is probably Pro Tools 7, Pro Tools 6 or 7. I'm not even sure if it supported like variable tempo maps back then. So rather than the usual way that we would program things, because it was never done with MIDI, it was always done on screen. Like Every drum part would be carefully lined up to be sample accurate and every, everything in exactly its right place. So they'd all hit together where they needed to be. Um, I had to do it visually. <laughs> so I, had, I recorded the audio of a clip track running at 16th. And every time I needed to move a part around, I couldn't just pick it up and nudge it on the grid. I had to pick it up and reference it to this audio click track and put it back in the right place. So it was, um, i tell you why it was. It was because we did the piano in Logic, which was quite unusual for Guy back then, and it did support floating tempo maps. But when we went back to tools to do everything else, we would no way of bringing the tempo map with us mm. and no time to make a new one because it was all just like, whoosh, you know, whip through, get, get on, try and make this track happen. Um, so it was quite a technical exercise um, and a lot of the work that you do with Guy is like that because his way of working is all about using Pro Tools and the things that go with it as a massive sound design tool so much of what he does is based around building up sound using the building blocks of digital audio and using processing in really interesting ways that most people haven't even thought of so it's not just as simple as oh you play the piano part and then you put the string over it on there's a lot more to it than that um, so that kind of mixing the it wasn't really full of like creative choice about 
different places you could take it. It was more just being a facilitator mm. all the way through the process to the end and sticking with it. He did, um, Guy Sigsworth, I'm pretty sure it's him, he did an amazing um, version um, of All Is Full of Love by Bjork. Do you know it? That's right, yeah. It's it my, fa- like, my favourite version of that song, actually. Is it the, the version that's on the, the, um, the, that was the single version? Yeah, I think it was the single version, that's right. Because there's a, uh, let me get this right, there's a remix he did of it as well, but he was in Björk's band back then. Oh, right. So every time you hear a harpsichord or a clavichord or anything like that, that's Guy. Oh, interesting. Um, and he would occasionally do a bit of production, so he co-wrote and produced Unravel. Right. Um, All Is Full Of Love, the version on the single was the one that, like, everyone wanted to put on the album but at the last minute she swapped it with a remix by someone else right. so the album has this kind of ambient close out and if I'm correct in thinking that Guy's remix is all around this kind of strange John Hassel trumpet loop yes it yeah. is that's exactly it yeah, yeah yeah Guy had done a lot of work with John and John has this gorgeous kind of breathy soft unusual trumpet tone that he allies with unusual pitch shifting to get like strange chords and intervals that you wouldn't normally be the starting point of, of a jazz musician. Mm. Um, he did a lot of work with Brian Eno and what they, they, what they were doing, they called fourth world music. Because what he had was he had this um, H3000 harmonizer by Eventide that he would pre-program with like multi-timbral pitch shifts that would deliberately shift the trumpet into not just, oh, let's put a third and a fifth in. You know, it would be really unusual intervals that yeah. he would blow in and this odd chord would come out. And that's a lot of the way that John thinks about music. Oh, it's great. Um, And uh, Guy was a big fan of John's and had done a lot of work with him. Um, And he's on the Fru Fru record, for example, that Guy did. He's on that Bureau track. Um, So, yeah, that's that's one of the guy's things. And he progressed from being... He had already written with Seal and he had done other bits of production jobs and then he was Bjork's musical director and Clavicord, Harpsicord and then moved into being a full-time producer. Um, and that was around the time I met him. He'd just done What It Feels Like For A Girl with Madonna. Right. Which obviously then completely changed his career. And so yeah. when I came in, that was why he was getting these amazing offers because he'd taken this incredible sound world that he's able to harness and managed to latch it onto something like one of the world's biggest commercial artists. producing commercial artists like that have you ever had to be in the position where you're like a mediator between what the record company want and what the artist wants and you've got to produce look they want something particularly commercial and so we're going to have to do this and how would you deal with that situation with the young musician well a lot of the production work that I've done has actually been at a lower level than that so I've been kind of shielded from it but I've watched the process in action and the times when it tends to work the best is Obviously, everybody involved wants to make a record that people will buy. Yeah. And everybody wants something that will sell. And they don't want to just necessarily make compromises and second-guess themselves and their audience to make that happen. Um, and in the case, like, I remember watching the process of doing every time with Britney when we would send mixes to... Um, I think Steve Lunt was her and our man back then at Jive and the notes that we would get back. And he was very good because his A&R notes were extremely specific about what he wanted. There was no kind of general, you know, silly notes. They were very specific. And for a long time, the track didn't have drums. And he was the one who was like, it needs some kind of rhythmic basis. And there was a couple of points in the vocal where he'd just be like, watch for that because it's got a slight musical theatre tendency. And we would rein those things in, we put the drums in, and then they accepted it. And so I got to watch that process. I think what you have And to do you have to follow that process? Out of interest, yeah, what's the... You, you've yeah, been commissioned to do yeah, a job. And so if you don't want it to... 
like if Guy's in a position where he's got this track that the artist has written that she's really close to emotionally, that he has worked out a way of doing that she finds incredibly satisfying, that the record company hears some possibility in commercially, mm. you want to find a way to try and satisfy those things the best you can. You don't want to be putting yourself in a position where you're saying, well, I've decided it needs to be this kind of weird art project instead. And then you end up making yourself happy and making nobody else happy, and then it ends up in a vault unheard. That would seem to be a kind of pointless exercise. I mean, when I produce people, generally you want to please yourself and, and make sure that you feel you've made the record com communicate what it's trying to say the best it possibly can. Um, but you have to walk a line with the artist as well because you don't want them to feel that you've completely compromised what it is that they do. Yeah. But sometimes you have to get them to trust you so that you can take them with you down a path they might not have thought that they were initially very interested in going down or they were slightly fearful of, that you think might be for the overall benefit of the record. And the thing is that like, I, I do love music and I want to make records that I would enjoy listening to and that people would enjoy listening to, but I also want to make a record that the artist I'm working with would feel represents them the best it can do, you know? And sometimes they need a bit of a push too to make that happen. And Richard, from your perspective, you must have been in the studio before, perhaps with Suede, and you've written pieces of music and the producer wants to perhaps change it in any way. How have you felt about handing stuff over? Were you quite cool with that? Um, well, yeah, I'm fine with that. I think I was so young when I started that, um, to be honest, it was, you know, anything. I would do anything I was asked, you know. Um, just, you know, I, yeah, songs get kind of um, um, chopped and changed all the time, usually by Brett, but... Um, We've done a couple of albums with Ed Buller recently as well, who we used to, Swade used to work with back in the 90s. And um, and he's very much one for... Um, he's not backward in coming forward if he doesn't like something or if he, or in making suggestions about changing it. Um, and that's, that has been really useful at points, yeah, that he'll sort of say, this bit isn't working, or, you know, we need to change this, or this bit needs to be more... Um, just, just better, basically. And um, he's, he was very useful when we first started writing for Blood Sports in 2011 and 2012. Um, he was very useful when it came to just basically saying to us, "Look, this isn't going to cut it. You have to up your game." You know, and in te and he's quite te musically um, uh, sort of technical about that as well. Not just in terms of this isn't good enough, but um, he would say you need to be doing stuff a little like this. Here are your strengths. Here is your skill set. You need to be embracing that. Um, and he would get quite technical about it. So at points it's been really useful. And of course, you know, it, it, there are other points as well where it kind of, especially him and Brett will go head to head in terms of what's, what what suede should sound like. You know, wow. a big disagreement about that during um, Night Thoughts. Um, and what's your what's your role then? Is that to uh, give your honest uh, opinion? Or is it sit, back, up sit once back and open some popcorn? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Watch it unfold. No, it's uh, we. I mean, me and Neil end up stuck in the middle of it during those situations. There were a lot of um, moments on Blood Sports and Night Thoughts when we were kind of caught in the middle of that. But, um, it's just part it? part of the creative process. You know, as long as everyone's happy with the end result, it's worth the uh, blood, sweat, and tears and um, side sideward glances at each other. <laughs> um, and what would, uh, talking about Brett, what would someone uh, learn from working with Brett that they wouldn't learn working with anyone else? Um, it, I think Brett is just so, it's so, it's so instinctive when it comes to music. He, he'd be the first person to admit that, that music isn't a kind of technical thing for him. He's not really, he doesn't really sort of, um, in any technical terms, he doesn't really sort of concentrate on how it works or anything like that it's not something you could learn from a book it's all completely instinctive with him and often you can give him a piece of music that you think sounds amazing and you can imagine as being one, a really classic amazing sway track I've done that many times in the past quite recently as well and um, he'll just not get it he'll just it, it won't it won't sort of ignite his instinct you know and so you can sort of say but listen to it let's do it again try again with it you know there's a great song in here I know it and um, and he will try with it, you know, until he's blue in the face. But if it doesn't get, if he doesn't instinctively understand it, get it, and, and it and will inspire him, if none of that happens, then it's it's dead, you know. <laughs> so um, there's, there's quite a lot of dead material underneath the surface of Swayze. How do you um, compartmentalise your relationship as a friend to a professional one? So when you just mentioned about putting up like, popcorn and that kind of thing, and seeing people <laughs> kind of fall out in the studio. Yeah. 
if you can see it going towards that, how do you, is there any techniques that you have having been in a band for so many years and working with the same people for many, many years? Yeah. Is there any techniques you actually have that you can kind of compartmentalise the two things? They, they are often having to evolve those techniques. Yes, they've been there since day one. It's some um, interband politics and there's such a lot of emotional politics, with, with, you know, with the band like Sway and probably loads with us as well. It's like... The sway especially is that a lot of the people that kind of meet us and get to know us are amazed that we can't, that we don't really sort of discuss anything. All the emotion, all the deep issues, good and bad, come out in the music. And there isn't, you know, when we actually sit and talk to each other, there's so much unsaid. It's just, you know, that only ever comes out once you plug in. I think that's... Um, that's probably a classic thing with a lot of bands. But No, I think, and Sean and we, we sort of discuss things a lot more. But... Um, Again, it's part of the actual urge to be a musician, especially the urge to be a songwriter, is all about self-expression in the most um, indulgent way possible, you know. And it's it's been creating my art. That's what it is. It's art, self-expression. It's, it falls under the same umbrella because there's stuff that you can't get out unless you actually write songs to get it out. And it's not, I'm, I'm sure any songwriter will say the same thing. Um, you're both gifted uh, musicians um, who've done lots of interesting things. What bad habits do you have that you would teach a young musician not to do? <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing about this record was that um, I have had a tendency in the past when producing things um, to sort of slightly worry about what it is that I'm doing and think, oh, it's, there's not enough going on, there's not enough, it's like it's too empty, it's too sparse. Um, I'll just fill it with kind of gorgeous watercolour synth washes and ambience and, you know, little oral tricks. Um, and I just came to loathe that part of my style. I just felt like I was making the same record over and over again. Um, and when we made this album, one of my things was like, if there's a guitar, there's a guitar, and it's really obvious it's a guitar and it's at the front, and when there isn't, it's going to shut up. And if there's a vocal, it's going to be singing, and when there isn't, it's going to shut up. <laughs> and it's like, I was trying to pair the sound back as much as possible. So one thing I'd say is, like, don't be afraid of analysing the work you've done before to see what mm. you can get to next. Yeah. But also, like, bad habits can just be things where you're realising you're doing something because of a lack of self-belief or a lack of self-confidence. And it's like, well... The whole point of being creative is to have the freedom to fail, you know. And you have to, and I still struggle with this. But you have to learn to accept the process, and know that the results may never be heard by anybody, or might flop, or might be misinterpreted, or whatever. You have to just be prepared to go through that process and just accept the process for what it is. And actually, the process of us making this record apart from the bit where I have to do my vocals, which is always a pain, I really enjoyed. Because one thing about it was we just bashed through it. Mm. We did it quickly. We didn't overthink it. We wrote all the songs first. We weren't writing and then going straight into recording. We separated the two processes, which actually in the modern era is quite rare. Because now it's not like the old days where you'd demo it on four track and then you'd go into a real studio. You're doing it all on the computer and that's where your final mix will be as well. We separated those two processes. I think that was really good. So... Yeah, don't be afraid to put like obstacles in your way. Analyze what it is, what you've done before, and work out where it might take you next. Learn to accept the process, and not necessarily the end result as the intrinsic part of the job. I love something you said there, which is a thing that's um, actually I've picked up a lot in the last couple of weeks about um, creativity is kind of linked to having the freedom to fail. Um, we are recording this the day after England beat Tunisia in the World Cup and England's manager Gareth Southgate uh, two weeks ago said he said to his players that um, I, I expect to see mistakes from you because if you're not making mistakes, you're not being creative enough. So it's kind of a similar thing. Um is the risk with that, though, that you go too much into the kind of... You do make mistakes in a way, you know? So, like, you're being creative, being creative, but actually you're making mistakes. You put out something, and then it's just not what you're good at. Well, I mean, part of being creative is that you have to learn to be a creator, but you have to learn to be an editor. Like anybody yeah. who writes will tell you this, is you might be able to let your imagination run free with the thing that you're putting together, but there has to be a certain point in the process when your mental editor has to sit down and say, right, let's make sense of this. You know, you have to be slightly self-aware as somebody creative. That it's not just a case of, well, I've worked for a really long time on this, so it must be good. You yeah. have to be able to take a step <laughs> yeah. back and say, yeah. it's just not really happening. Like, a lot of the songs we didn't take past demo stage. Yeah. 
I, I can remember that we had this song called The Future Will Happen Without Us, which is such a great title, and we might have to have another go at it at some point. But I remember beating the lyric into the ground over the course of days and days and days, and it was obvious that it was just not going to work. But I had to try and get it to a point where I felt it might work, so I would know for sure, you know? Um, and yeah, you sometimes you will make a mistake and you will release it. You know, the stuff yeah. that I've done in the past with us and with other things I've been involved with where I just listen to it now and go, I don't really like the choices I made there. Yeah. But that's life. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, my, from my experience, the two, the two suede albums that people um, like the least or at least get the most panned in retrospective reviews are Head Music and A New Morning. And they're both examples of us having a certain idea about the kind of record it was going to be and writing to that template, following that idea, realising halfway down the road that it wasn't really going to work, but thinking, no, we're going to see this through, and uh-huh. then seeing it through. To, that's exactly how head music finished, was right, we've come to the end of this journey, and not, not having achieved exactly what we wanted to achieve, but at least having done it. And it was the same with A New Morning, that was going to be a, a, a folk record, and then it kind of got to a progressive folk record, and it kind of got taken in different directions, because it took so long for us to finish it, but we thought, we've got to see it through, we didn't abandon it. And so there, there's something to be said for that kind of determination, but at the same time, those are the two records that people aren't sure about, and go, you know. so um, it's kind of like a, a double-edged sword, really. It's um, admirable to have that determination, but at the same time, um, it can sort of damage you a bit. <laughs> you know? But of course, like, you know, band signed to Sony in the 90s with budgets to match, it means that if you're in that process... Oh, yes, you're under con- so much contract with somebody, yeah, and they say, we want it on our desks by Tuesday morning. Wow. Know? And they keep the financial so, tap turned on while you're doing all of this. Yeah, and so you have to finish it in one, way, in one form or another. But Whereas with us, it's like, obviously, it's possibly low reward, but simultaneously yeah. it's low risk. Yeah. Because the only people we have to please are our, is ourselves. And if we had written all these songs and made an album and decided that we didn't like it, mm. like it would have been a bit annoying, but there wouldn't have been hundreds of thousands of pounds of recording time at stake. It would have been like, okay, well... Maybe, well let's write some more songs. Let's write some more songs. Been, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And can I be self-indulgent and ask you to talk us through the writing process, Beautiful Ones, because I love that <laughs> song. I absolutely love that song, Dancing Around Last Night after the England victory to it. So, uh, right. yeah, tell us what were your memories of that. It's such a tune. Um, well, it was, I was doing a lot of demos at home. I had this little basement flat off Westbourne Grove back then, and um, I was doing a lot of um, demo. This is probably summer 1995, once we'd finished the Dogman Style Tour. I was right, giving Brett a lot of cassettes with just basic eight-track demos on. That was one of them. I didn't really know what it was supposed to be. It sounded quite breezy in summary, but um, uh, that, that wasn't the t- we didn't have a template for the album at that point, so I didn't know whether that was appropriate. But it just seemed to really strike a chord with Brett. He immediately within 24 hours, I think, but given me a cassette back of him singing just, and it was just phrases at that point. There wasn't really a proper lyric over the top. It was, um, he was kind of painting with words, just throwing phrases. And it's kind of kept that, the finished version has kept that sort of, you know, um, I don't know what the best um, artistic comparison would be, but, you know, Jackson Pollocking or something with um, with phrases and painting with words. and. That it, it kept that, but it was uh, that that seemed to really strike a chord with him. And then I think because it was quite light and acoustic and strummy in um, the original version, um, and had a different chorus, had a minor key chorus. Really? Um, yeah, he wanted to kind of keep the celebratory feel of the verse going, so he said, "Let's do a chorus in C major or, or C C flat major, whatever it was." And um, so we wrote this new chorus over the top of it, which seemed, which was much more poppy, and then. Um, then I think I wanted to work up an actual guitar intro for it. And that took a little while, but I do remember when I hit on that guitar line and recorded it and given it to Brad, I think he liked it so much that he got, and I was with my best friend Peter, who now does the, um, uh, art, he's an artist who does the art magic sleeves. Yeah. He's our secret weapon. Um, he was staying with me, and this, this would have been, yeah, this would have been autumn 95. And Brett said that he'd been up for a couple of days, and he said, um, "Come over, we want to play that song." And so I brought Pete over, and we all and he had this tiny little writing room, which was barely big enough to be a single bedroom. It was a tiny little box room, and we all crammed in there. And he basically got me to play this guitar line, which is the opening line, over and over and over and over again <laughs> for him and his friend Alan. I think this might be documented somewhere. And um, with Peter in the corner, just watching all this happen, just, you know, I don't know what the hell was going through his head. For me, that was quite normal by that point. He <laughs> invited him to the middle of performance, you know, the Mick Jagger film. <laughs> so um, I'd turn up sober and I'd play play music and. Uh, 
Yeah. Um, but that was how it got written. It was um, it was a real kind of the evolution of it was quite weird because it's what people know it as. The f- and Ed wanted to turn it into a real groove piece. So he, so we got this really groove. I think he it was either slower or faster, but he found a perfect tempo for it, and then he got the sort of maracas going on it, and it was suddenly, it was a dance song almost, you know, it was a, a suede song you can dance to, which is unusual. Um, and yeah, he wanted the, the La La's and the Archer, I'm pretty sure that was um, his idea, oh no, it might have been Brett's idea actually. Um, but uh, it just sounded so much what coming up was, was about. It didn't sound quite as sort of indie guitar as some of the other tracks, but that was a plus point, you know, it was we were trying to sort of move in a different direction and be more poppy on that record. Um, and it just ticked all the boxes, yeah, and it was, I'm not surprised it's the one that, that resonates the most. Um, we, it was, tra- uh, Trash was more of a flagship single, you know, mm. the opening statement for coming up, but Beautiful Ones, I think, was the kind of, the, the backbone standout track, and still is. It's just, we you know, we've done gigs in places like, um, you know, Santiago and Chile and, and, you know, Hong Kong, and it's just the place erupts when we play Beautiful Ones in, in a way that it doesn't for some of the other hits. There's something about that song that means everyone throws their arms in the air and it's like a Rosalo moment, you know. That must be so such a strange thing that, given that you do the intro to that, it's like the almost the power at your fingertips, knowing that you can create this emotional shift in so many people. The yeah. moment you start playing it, it must yeah. be so surreal. Yeah. Like, it is. It's kind of you can see people light up and sort of you know. I think a lot of our material is quite dark, and even the hits like Animal Nitro, are quite still quite dark and um, moody and um, aggressive. And Beautiful Ones is just so much the opposite of that. You can see people going, oh, no, they're playing this one. How nice, you know? <laughs> and, and let's talk about big shows. You've both played some pretty big shows in, in your time. Um, how do you, what do you do to excel in high-pressure environments? So you're quite experienced now, but maybe back in the day, like if you're playing really, really high-profile shows, there's a lot riding on it, perhaps viewing figures, whatever it might be. How do you excel? How do you perform at your best in those kind of when you most under the spotlight, if you like. I mean, do you get nervous before you do shows? S- at certain points, yeah. When we did um, Glastonbury, I'm having a moment when we did Glastonbury, which was in 2015, Suede, um, and we, it was being broadcast live on, on BBC Four or something, and uh, which is fine, no problem with that. But we got to do, we got to a point where we did a B-side called The Living Dead, which is just me and one acoustic guitar and, and Brett. And um, he kind of went off mic and let the audience do the singing. So it was just me playing this intricate guitar part. And it suddenly struck me as like, oh my God, you're like, how many people are watching this? And it's just me on my own playing guitar. And Brett sort of wandering around letting the audience sing. And I was thinking, if I make a mistake now, it's going to be so exposed. If I play the wrong chord or something, it's just going to be the, the ultimate Les Dawson moment. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I was panicking, going, please don't make a mistake, please. And that, that, so it's moments like that when, you, when it suddenly kicks in, the, the kind of magnitude of what you're doing in terms of um, having to get it right. Um, but not normally, no. It's like gigs are... I mean, well, that's a good example because normally gigs are kind of such a kind of rush of adrenaline all the way through. It almost goes by in a blur, and you just sort of, you know, um, grind and grind and grind and do it and play your best and get to the end and then kind of collapse into a sofa and start eating pizza. Um, <laughs> that's kind of how it works. And yeah, but there's it's the, the quiet, hushed moments is when you suddenly realise where you are and what you're doing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it can be quite surreal at points. Sounds amazing. And um, any tips you would give? Something that I mentioned earlier before we started recording the, that performance you did with uh, of Only You at the uh, it was a fashion show, it was wasn't a fashion it? Launch you had, you had uh, Kate Moss there, Benedict Cumberbatch, loads of interesting people. We were ordered watching. not to look at the celebrities. Really? Yeah. Because they because they're right at the front, so they're literally feet away from you, and you were told beforehand like don't eyeball them. Um, which is like under, completely understandable. I have no problem with that as a policy, but it does have a little bit of like stand in the corner and don't think of an elephant <laughs> because then you're standing there doing it. And then all you're thinking is in my peripheral vision, I can see St. Vincent, but I can't look at St. Vincent. So, Oh, there's, there's Cumberbatch. Oh, no, no, no. But he's sort of looking just above their heads and sort of defocusing slightly. That was actually one of the few shows 
where I got a little bit nervous. I don't generally get nervous before I go on stage, um, if I'm well prepared. If I am not well prepared, then I get very nervous indeed. Mm. Um, but because there was so much at stake with this, um, you know, it was being going out on, it was going like live on YouTube. I was live as well, was A it? lot of people were watching. There's a lot of riding on it. There's a lot of photographers, press interest, and you only get one shot. You've got this very expensive setup because it's not just expensive in the sense of the item you're launching, but you know, the people actually standing on the stage is a 15 piece string ensemble. Um, so that was a little bit nerve wracking, um, but came off okay. But generally speaking, um, yeah, I mean, everyone's reaction to going on stage is different and mine is kind of horrendously straightforward. I don't get nervous really if I'm prepared. And I think that's the key is be prepared. So how do you deal with it when you are put into a position, have you been in a position where you haven't had time to be able to pay and maybe a last minute change or anything like that? Let's say you were doing that performance and they said, right, okay, actually we're going to slightly change the key so your harmony is going to change or something like that. Would that really throw you out and how would you deal with that? Um, I think I'd probably be okay because just once I've got the song in my head, it's like I can, unless it puts me in a key where it's, I'm going to be attempting, you know, helium singing. <laughs> Um, I need to be quite warmed up. Otherwise, it's not normally a problem. I mean, that's the thing is, like, I'm, I'm quite musically minded, and once things go in, they tend to stay in to a large degree. Um, it would be different if it was a kind of, you know, Bob Dylan playing with the Heartbreakers thing where he would just start a song and they would be expected to follow him. Mm, I think yeah. that might be more of a problem. Or The Fall. I think I read a story about when Julian Nagel joined The Fall in, like, 1994 or five or something. And um, Mark was dead because Mark used to do this a lot, keep people on their feet. He thought you get the best performance out of people if they're unprepared. And he said to her, "You're coming and doing a gig with us at the Astoria in two weeks." And he wouldn't tell her what the set list was. He went, oh. and they weren't weren't going to rehearse. So she basically had to just learn everything, in just in case they played it. Wow. I think that, I think that was her. Yeah. But, um, we had um, we had a guy called Shane Keaston. He used to play with uh, Elvis and. Um, if you listen to these recordings that Elvis did, he would just go, you ain't nothing but a... And they'd have to come in on Hound Dog. Yeah. Yeah, that's all he gave them. But what he revealed was that on stage, remember Elvis used to do like Kung Fu movements and stuff like that on stage? Mm-hmm. That was actually a key. To, it was like oh, was a code it? for them to I go, right, this is what we're going right. to do. It's coming like up. Like a baseball code. Yeah, 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 pretty much. And they were the Kung Fu moves. That's why I did it, which is quite revealing. Um, let's begin to wrap up. Um, if you think about uh, being in the studio again, and as I say, from both sides, from being in a band or or being produced and, 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 and being a producer, what are specific techniques you've seen or heard of that really get the best out of people who are maybe anxious, nervous, you know, the red light syndrome kind of stuff? Have you heard of any techniques that might be useful to share? Well, I should tell a story about when I was still at college. I was at Lipper in the 90s, the Liverpool Institute of Performing Arts, and I was doing their science and technology degree. And a friend of mine, um, who I got to know, because of this she was doing a session with somebody and she was doing a vocal and so she's in in the booth it was proper studios you know proper booth proper isolation doing her vocal and then she came in next door to listen and the guys who were doing the session with her thought it'd be really funny to feed her voice through a harmonizer and put it a semitone flat so they played it back and she'd think that she was out of tune all the way through the song oh. and they thought this would be really funny not taking a second to think about what this would do to her self confidence wow. um I think that every single person in a technical role in the studio should spend half a day being a singer, even if they can't sing, so they can understand what it means to have a headphone mix, so they can understand the vulnerability and the isolation that happens when the tape stops and the machine stops and nobody's on the talkback to reassure you. <laughs> yeah. It's really important to just be left in that kind of silence, especially when you can see people talking but you can't yeah. hear what they're saying. Yeah. I mean, I love doing vocal sessions with people. I love doing vocal production and part of it is because I really empathize with the singer you know because I've been there and I know how they feel and the vulnerability you can feel and you just want to help them do the job the best they can and just find the bits in the performance where you know they're only at 80% and get them up to as close to 100 as you can without making them feel vulnerable or, or like emotionally challenged I suppose is the way you put it I think it's possible to make great records without having to be horrible to people you know I mean Marky e. Smith would obviously have differed and there are a lot of different ways to make a record but I like to make people feel like they're valued that their talent is valued and if somebody is doing something that puts them way out of their comfort zone and it's going to take a long time it's okay it takes a long time send everybody else out of the studio they can go down the pub that's fine and we'll just work on this bit and it might take some time, but I'll stay with it. It's fine, and you can stay with it too, and I'll make you feel good about it. 
and then we'll get to a point when it's done and it will have been worthwhile and at no point in the process will I have made you feel like an idiot and that's so important because you can have a day where you can come in and you can just bash it out and it's all great on take three or whatever and sometimes it's not going to be that simple you know and sometimes things need to be pieced together slowly and making the people that you're working with feel that this is all a worthwhile endeavor that you value what it is they're bringing to the process like i did some stuff that never came out for a band where the drummer was not the greatest drummer in the world but he had really good ideas mm. like his way of approaching how he would propel the band and the grooves he would come up with were really good ones it's just that he wouldn't necessarily be the most fluid player but that's okay and so we would take time and if i was specific about what i think it needs to build here we might need to fill it's fine. We'll just loop around it till he gets it. And I can always tweak it a bit afterwards to make it sound the best it could possibly be. There's no point making you feel bad about it. You're at the limits of your ability. If I can help get you up that extra 10%, I'll do it. And I'm going to make you feel good about it. Yeah. I think that's really important. Like, I'm, hopefully, with you, yeah. I'm, I, I hope it's mostly positivity. Yeah. Maybe, it is, maybe I'm more negative than I think I am, but generally... No, no, not to, no. Um, no, I think it's... Um, because it is so one-to-one -one recording with Art Magic, I'm not, we're in the same room and we, we, we don't often go into separate rooms even to no, I don't. I could, right. I could do all my recording in the control room, so there's very much a kind of, there isn't that, like you say, that I've had experiences like that where you play, you play a solo, you play some kind of part and then you can see people through the glass kind of going like this and talking to each other and you think oh, well, you can't hear what they're saying and then eventually they go do you want to have another go at that it's on the top back <laughs> you know, but you've missed why they you know um, no I think with you and me it's, it's, it's pretty I think because we, we know you know how to get good performances out of me you know as a guitarist and I think we just don't we're on the same page there's never been a point where it's been a case of, you know, what, what exactly do you want me to play? We I mean, I occasionally, fall, I will sometimes fall over myself attempting to explain a half-formed idea. <laughs> and that's about as bad as it gets, I think, you know. Um, I think that every person who works on the technical side should understand how much every musician is putting themselves on the line every time they pick up an instrument. And that goes from people who've just learned to play three chords on the acoustic guitar all the way through to the virtuoso in whatever field. And I think they have to keep that in mind, you know. Question for each of you. Uh, what's your most important piece of music memorabilia that you own? What do you do? Do I own any music memorabilia? Not memorabilia. I've got little bits and bobs that I'm really proud of. I've got a, a copy of Metal Box that I bought when I was a teenager um, from that shop that was on... What's that road off um, Tottenham Court Road? Right, right in the centre, north Tottenham Court Road, off to the left. Uh, Good tree, don't uh, do Mac. No, no, it's a tiny little road. There's a, there's a vintage record shop there. Oh, was this was like there's a little DJ shop yeah, there as well. Yeah. I know the road you mean. I can't remember what it's that called. That shop. I found a copy of Metal Box in there. It was a little bit kind of tarnished and a bit rusty looking, and I bought it for a huge amount of money. And that's kind of because I love the package and I love Peel. It's a record that means so much to me that I'm often just getting out and having a look at it. You know, um, when it comes to memorabilia, I'm not really a collector to be honest. Or anything of value from your, I don't know, passes. Oh, right. Or, yeah, anything of value that you've picked up over um, the Well, there's little things that kind of, you know, if a gig goes really well, you sort of keep something from it, or I do anyway. I mean, Or set I, lists I, or something like that. No, just like, I mean, I think I've, the, the Royal Albert Hall gig we did in March 2010 was, was our kind of reunion gig, and it went so well that I ended up believing that the, the shirt that I wore, which is just some cheap black shirt, um, it had some kind of good luck charm inside it so I've still got that hanging up you know and that's really old and tatty um, just things like that really little good luck symbols and um, nice yeah I'd have to think quite hard <laughs> I mean I, I tend to keep like I've got my Alice and Moy tour books and laminates and festival armbands and stuff but the thing is whilst I may keep these if they all go in a box and I keep thinking, oh, that's. I'd be nice to look back in that box one day, but I never want to actually look in it. And I always think one maybe when I'm, were. maybe when I'm seventy, I'll be like, right yeah. now, I'm allowed yeah. to be nostalgic. Perhaps last tape, sort of. Thing. A little <laughs> bit. I mean, I'm, I'm like that. I have an art magic box which is full of our old set lists and yeah. you know, again, festival passes or whatever. Um, but actually, I think one of the things I'm most proud of, and I don't have it anymore because it was a text message. Um, I made a couple of records producing a band called Tempo Shark back in the mid-2000s, um, both of which I think are very good, which sadly never really realised their commercial potential. But the first one, Rob, the singer from Tempo Shark, 
um, started getting involved with the art world, which is actually now where he works now, and he's been very successful. And he was at something, and Neil Tennant from the Pet Shop Boys was there. I love, properly love the Pet Shop Boys. And they were going on to another do, or there was some thing afterwards, and so Neil ended up offering Rob a lift. And Rob, never missing a chance to do some self-promotion, stuck his album on in the car while they were driving. And Neil Tennant's comment was, oh, I quite like this. And I was like, I can die happy. <laughs> Neil Tennant's heard one of my tracks and he thinks it's quite good. That'll do me. So, um, and sadly, somewhere along the way, because of you yeah. know, phones changing, I lost that message. Yeah. But I will never, ever forget when I received it. That um, really meant a huge amount to me. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, I, keep, I have like... I have stuff up to keep me inspired in the studio. I've framed record sleeves, Kate Bush, Gary Newman, David Bowie, Depeche Mode. Um, but it's like, I don't really view those as kind of memorabilia. Yeah. You know, they're just kind of, they're just adding a flavour to my workspace yeah. to make it an inviting place to be. Yeah. What a classic story if you tell your grandchildren from your career. Oh, I don't really have any. I'm really boring. I'm really dull. I mean, I don't really do... The, the, story, kind of, the story of how beautiful ones are written, I'd, I'd tell. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the other story of how I joined Sway, I think that's quite interesting. That's a great story. And, um, so you just sent. I used to have to tell that all the time, and then I stopped doing interviews because, because it's <laughs> that, that always... was all I ever got asked. Yeah, yeah. What's the question we've always wanted to ask you? What was it like joining Sway? <laughs> Twenty years later, I can't remember anymore. Yeah. That's why it's not here, that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, final question then. Each of you, it would be great if you could uh, have a think and answer this. Um, what fears do you have for the music industry, and how might those fears be addressed? A lot of our fears have probably been realised. Yeah, I think it's. I don't think that it's in a kind of worse position than it was, you know, when we did the last album. To be honest, I think it, I don't. Yeah. I think it's in a worse position personally. Right. Well, yeah. In what way? Why? Well, there's all sorts of reasons. I think the main problem is one that becomes kind of insoluble in a way. Is that a unsolvable, not insoluble? Um, the, the value of music has been like. Denatured. I think there was a time when music was seen as having cultural heft. It was seen as something important by people and something they want to be part of. Um, and now I think it's just like another flavour of crisps. It's something you dive into maybe to make you feel a certain way or to make the hours go a bit faster at work. But it's like we collectively got together in the after Napster and decided that we had decided how much music was worth and what it was worth was nothing. And I think, and I'm not even talking about that from a, pu- a purely commercial point of view, because nobody wants to hear old, older musicians wanking on about how everything was much better back in the old days of CD sales. That's why I'm keeping my mouth shut. <laughs> but it, it's, it's just about the fact that, like, regardless of what the commercial rewards and risks may be, I think the actual value of what music means to people has changed in a way that's going to be difficult to put that genie back in the bottle. Then again, I'm 42 and I don't relate to music like a 16 year old does. Mm. And they might be getting just as excited about the stuff that they listen to on YouTube and the new things they're discovering through One Extra and sort of, Mm. you know, Spotify Discover. So I don't want to, I don't think it's fair for me to negate their experience um, either. But I think that commercially, we're in a slow downward spiral because yes, we're generating new music that's being successful, but it's not generating the kind of revenues that's going to make it something that's just going to support itself, which is why every young artist has to have brand types. The music can't really exist anymore for a mass audience um, in isolation anymore. You have to have these other things that tie in with it to make it commercially viable. And I think that's a terribly sad thing that the music can't stand on its own anymore. Um, And I think as well that we're seeing this kind of tidal wave of reissues and vinyl becoming this fetish object. But really what's happening is they've identified the last group of people who are prepared to spend money on physical media, which is like 5% 16-year-olds and 95% 50-year-old hedge fund managers trying to recapture their youth by rebuying all these albums they liked when they were kids. Mm. And, you know, that audience is, in that 95% majority audience is inherently got a ticking clock against it. And those people aren't going to be around forever. And how many times can we keep reissuing the catalogue and making money off it? And where does that money go to support new artists? And the answer is, well, it kind of doesn't really. Um, I think we're heading for what Momus in the 90s said um, was actually really accurate. He posited that in the future, everyone will be famous for 15 people. And 
think that I think that's precisely where we are now because you have all these tiny um, but unconnected subcultures that exist across music, and you have this umbrella of you know Ed Sheeran and Ray Strummer and Taylor Swift that's over the top of it, that's mainstream, and then beneath it you have this kind of almost infinitely fractal kind of neighbouring but not connected musical worlds where they just appeal to a tiny circle around them and nobody else. And I think that's sad. And I think that there's a lot of artists who could have had the cultural heft of a Prince or a David Bowie or a Michael Jackson or a Madonna where we're not going to see artists like that in the future because there simply isn't the money to invest in them and to give them the nurturing you need to get them to that point because there isn't a market that will support music at that cultural level anymore. It's a great answer. Richard, <laughs> thoughts? Well, I just... Uh, um, what was the question again? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, what fears do you have for the music industry and how might those fears oh, be addressed? Um, sh- well, I, I have to kind of echo what Sean said, really. I, I think that it's... Um, there's a lot of I think people's access to music is I can't really um, sort of find a huge fault with that I think people to you know things like Spotify you can complain in money terms or whatever but I'm not, not going to do that um, it's it's I think it's, it's it's good that people can have got so much access to uh, to music and I'm, I'm hoping that it is keeping it as an important art form to everyone I mean I, my thing is that I you know I'm going to sound like an old man now but um Basically, when you when you get on a flight or you get on the bus or even just get on the tube, everyone under the age of about 25 has got a pair of headphones glued to their head all the time. You know, Beats by Dr. Dre, and I find I find myself thinking, what are you all listening to? What are, and being someone that pays no attention to the charts, it's uh, I'm not I'm not proud of that. It's just that I can't be bothered. Um, you know, I don't know what's in the top ten. Uh, I don't listen to chart music. I don't listen to Radio One. So I do find myself looking at all these people and saying, are they listening to music? And if they are listening to music, what music are they listening to? Because everyone has got, no one's talking and they're looking at their phone and they've got headphones on. Mm. And it's like, what What are you listening to? I feel like asking them sometimes. I was going to say, ask them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah just end up appearing even more like an old man. <laughs> cool. So what's next for So obviously you've released the album last week or this week uh, yeah Friday just gone fantastic um, so what's next have you got you, you going to be playing live at all or? we've got a live show on the 29th in London 29th of mm-hmm. June which is already sold out um, and then Richard is going to be back in Suede World for a little while promoting their new record mm-hmm. which is out in September yeah the Blue Hour it's out 21st of September yeah great stuff um, and what do you think the future might hold do you think you'll do a third album then oh I think so unquestionably actually um, I think the next thing will be getting out and doing some touring hopefully spring 2019 um, trying to bring a few more people to the party and we may well do an EP to tie in with that as well to mop yeah. up the kind of other tracks we finished but didn't use for the album um, I think there will be a third album I mean anyone who's stuck with us this long will understand that we have to fit our creative endeavours around the fact that we both effectively have full time jobs elsewhere you know I'm a jobbing programmer singer producer mixer for other people the bulk of my work for the last five years has been with Alison Moyer I've done over 150 shows with her Richard when he's not writing with Suede is often touring with Suede mm. but we make time we manage to make time to make this record I would imagine the mechanics of how we might make the next one will be very similar because of those time pressures but yeah. where we might go musically might be something entirely different yeah yeah. I think yeah. we're going to push further away I think further into the margins I think is probably where we're going musically mm. I think you know that could change of course on a whim but right now that's what I feel like the stuff I really love on our new record is the stuff that feels like it has plenty of atmosphere yeah it does and you know isn't necessarily just straightforward first chorus songwriting and I'd like to see if we can go further with that perhaps mm. yeah yeah challenge the listener even more to use that phrase again <laughs> Perfect. Like, thank you so much. Congratulations on the album. I'm absolutely loving it. Um, yeah, get out touring next year. It'll be really interesting to see you, you perform some of these songs live. Thank um, yeah, thanks so much for appearing on the Stage of Podcast. Hope you enjoyed it, and uh, best of luck with the with the projects coming up. Thank, thank you very much. For more episodes featuring the likes of Richard Fortas of Guns N' Roses, George Vajestica on working with Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, John Woff of the 1975, Sam Hurleyhe of Hope of the States, Damon Minchella on working with Richard Ashcroft, and loads more, uh, go to thestageleftpodcast.com, follow us on Twitter at the Stage Left Pod, like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash thestageleftpodcast, and we're on Instagram now where you'll see lots of behind-the-scene photos of the recordings of the episodes and what we've been up to. Okay, we'll see you next time.